How are you? Good. So I like to make these talks pretty interactive. So if people have questions as, as I'm talking, feel free to pipe up. Um, so I'm one of the urologists here that specializes in what we call voiding dysfunction in, in your urology. So uh, I'm going to be talking about something that we call lower urinary tract symptoms, meaning if you go to the bathroom too much or too little, that's essentially what we're talking about. And I'm going to give a little bit of the male perspective. Dr. Herman's going to talk about uh, prostate cancer, and then Dr. Tripta is going to talk about uh, sort of the female counterpart to that. So um, hopefully there'll, there'll be enough that you'll see that's sort of linked in between all three talks that uh, the themes will make sense to you. So I'm going to talk about treatments and and uh, both classic and new for benign enlargement of the prostate. So for the men in the room, I assume most of the women here don't have prostates, for the, for the men in the room, uh, we all know that as you get older, your ability to urinate begins to deteriorate. And the classic example is, you know, uh, sitting beside your grandson and watching him go to the bathroom versus you're struggling for 10, 15, 20 minutes to, to finish uh, what you need to do. We're going to talk about classic or traditional treatments for men. We're talking about alpha blockers, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, anticholinergics, and then we're going to talk a little bit about sexual dysfunction and how that may relate to uh, lower urinary tract symptoms. And when I talk about LUTs or lower urinary tract symptoms, I'm talking about urinary frequency, urinary urgency, getting up in the middle of the night, those types of things. Okay, so uh, we all know that the prevalence of enlarged prostates increases with age and in fact you know when you're in your 40s about 10 percent of men have enlarged prostates by by the time you hit 50 that doubles to 20 percent by the time you hit 60s that uh, increases to 30 percent and, and concomitant with that we see an increase in medical and surgical therapies and this is a a, a very complicated yet uh, supposedly simple graph of how we in the back of our minds try to treat the symptoms that you come to us with in the office and I'm going to try to break this down to something a little bit simpler than, than a bunch of different squiggly lines. And so uh, aging and neurogenic issues lead to overactive bladder. What does this mean? So as you, let's see here. So when you're young, your prostate's nice and small and your bladder is fine. And as you get older, your prostate enlarges. And I tell people, think of the prostate like a donut. As you get older, that donut gets fuller and fuller. So the center channel becomes more and more constricted. Your ability to empty your bladder deteriorates concomitantly with this. And your bladder tries to compensate, it gets nice and big. It's, it's like going to the gym all the time and the muscle in the, in the bladder gets very thick and irritable. And over time, if you let this go, in fact, the muscle will decompensate. You know, thankfully, we don't see this very often, but, uh, but the sequence of events going from enlargement of the prostate to secondary reaction of the bladder uh, is something very, very common. Uh, and what are the treatments that we use for this? We talk about uh, medical therapy, again, the alpha blockers, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. We're going to talk about combination therapy. There's a number of different office-based treatments like microwave thermotherapy, Botox, some of you have probably heard of. And then there's surgical uh, treatments that we'll touch on very briefly. Okay. This is meant to give you a 20,000-foot overview of the different therapies we have out there. And then, you know, if you have questions, we can kind of talk more about them. So let's start in the early part of the century. So if you go back as far as the 1920s, that's probably the first time we were able to offer patients with enlargement of the prostate some type of relief. And what that was was something called the TERP procedure, transurethral resection of the prostate. So what if we go and find an enlarged prostate and basically go in with a fancy camera and reconstitute or open up the middle of the prostate? Some patients, in fact, call it like a roto-rooting of the prostate, which uh, I think well, it, it has some, uh, what's that? Has some validity. Has some validity. You know, we like to think we're a little more delicate than, than that. But the, but the theme, you know, is consistent. The idea that you go from a narrow channel to a wider channel, so you're able to empty your urine more freely. The, it, you know, this is an, or two, these are two examples of some of the instruments that we use. So here's the camera part. Here's a little fancy uh, electrode that we use to open up cut away, vaporize the tissue so men can urinate better. Uh, in the 1970s, we finally started coming around with something other than surgery to help people like you. So we started coming out with something called the alpha blockers. And what these medications did was to relax the muscle around the prostate. So basically, you would, re you would relax the donut, so to speak, and enlarge the channel that, that uh, you use to, to pass your urine. And, 
this is a graph of the improvement that we typically see. So this is a graph looking at the 12-month efficacy of something called alfuzacin. This is one of the medications we very commonly use. Uh, other examples include Rapiflow, Flomax. You've probably heard of some combination of these medications. And in fact, we see that patient symptoms improved dramatically, significantly over 12 months while you're on these medications. In the 1980s, we came out with another type of medication. Well, what if we actually shrunk the prostate? So instead of relaxing it, what if we actually managed to shrink it? Uh, finasteride or Proscar was the first uh, of these agents, followed a few years later by something called Avidart or, or Dutasteride. Um, and these, as you would imagine, have a lot of utility in men with larger prostates. And in fact, if you look at one of the trials, this, this is a graph looking at the maximum urinary flow rate, how quickly or how strongly you're able to urinate, and this is a graph looking at how symptomatic you are. You see that patients who got just a sugar pill didn't really change, and people who got the real medication actually did a lot better over time, urinate a lot more strongly. And in terms of symptoms, you see people who got the placebo didn't really move that far, and then the ones who got the medication actually did a lot better. So uh, two new medications or two new classes of medications that really allowed us to defer the need for surgery that allowed patients to, to take a pill instead of going to the operating room just to feel a little bit better. What about putting the two medications together? You know, I, I tell people urologists are pretty simple folk and, you know, we, we, we're not that complicated. So if you put one plus one together, you in fact get something greater than two. So combination therapy, putting an alpha blocker together with something like a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor actually shows pretty good benefit. And here's a good graph. So this is a sugar pill, so they do okay. This is the alpha blocker, like that first medication I showed you, they do better. This is the medication that shrinks your prostate alone, they do almost as, almost as well. But if you put the two together, they do the best, right? Which kind of makes sense. You know, one plus one should be two, or hopefully greater than two. So, what about the most recent past decade. So we, we put we got two new medications, we put them together, what else is out there? So it turns out that urination is actually a two-part process. So for men in particular, it's as much a function of your prostate and how large it is as it is a function of your bladder. And you'll probably hear a little bit more about the bladder when Dr. Chuck Tai talks because that's what we often have to address in women. So uh, but men also have bladders and maybe it's really the bladder that's causing people a lot of problems and not just the prostate. And so we've got medications in fact that can relax the bladder itself without touching the prostate. And th this is a, a, a graph from one of our studies, and so we're always afraid of giving men with big prostates medications to relax their bladder because then we figured they couldn't urinate. In fact, if we do that, we see that their symptoms also get better. Sort of a counterintuitive you know, finding from our, our literature, but it seems that in the proper patients, people with small prostates who go to the bathroom all the time who don't get enough relief from just one medication, if you add this bladder medication, they, they feel a lot better. Okay, so th those are sort of the traditional treatments that we've been using. What's out there that's new? What have you heard about in the news? Um, you know, some of the things that we're looking at is, you know, can the, what's the impact of the metabolic syndrome? So for example, people who are obese, have diabetes, heart disease, how does, that, how does that affect your ability to go to the bathroom? And you know, this influences both men and women, in fact. Um, where, what's the role of things like Viagra or Cialis that you hear about in the commercials in terms of their impact on your ability to go to the bathroom? So let's look at that. So sexual dysfunction and lower urinary tract symptoms. Again, going to the bathroom too much or too little. So this is how, this is, this is probably more complicated than, you, than anyone ever wants to see, but this is how Viagra works, okay? So if you take something like Viagra, and it inhibits the breakdown of one of the enzymes in your cells, and basically it relaxes smooth muscle and allows you to have, allows men to have an erection. Also turns out that it may influence how men feel when they go to the bathroom. So for example, one of my colleagues took 50 men with, who, with erectile dysfunction. They showed up in his clinic. He's a sexual dysfunction expert and said, I can't get, you know, I'm having problems being intimate with my partner. He said, well, fine. Let me give you some Viagra. But at the same time, he also asked them, how, how are you going to the bathroom? Are you having some problems? Are you having difficulty? 
And so he took this group of men who were having difficulty going to the bathroom, gave them Viagra, and then sort of compared them before and after. Sort of a pretty simple kind of study. And it turns out that those patients that he gave Viagra to actually got better in terms of not only their erections, but also how they felt when they went to the bathroom. We didn't really understand this, but 60% of men got better. It's a pretty significant number of people. And we took, you know, we had several other studies, and this is the biggest one probably of them all. This is a study looking at Cialis, which is a cousin of Viagra, very similar. We took over a thousand men aged 40 or older with a history of going to the bathroom too much or too little. And, uh, you know, we studied them. The men were about 60 years old. We looked at them for about three months. And this is a very complex diagram of how, you know, the, 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 the scientists actually randomize the patients to each group. But essentially what you need to take away from this, they went from lowest dose of Cialis to highest dose of Cialis. And if you look at, if you remember that, and you look at this graph, lowest dose, higher, 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 highest. And the bigger the drop, the better the men urinated, or the better the men felt like when they were urinating. And these are all the trials, you know, this is a busy slide, but you know, there's been about 10, 11 studies looking at this, and all of them have corroborated or verified this initial finding. Men tend to feel better when they urinate. They, may, they actually may not urinate more strongly, but they certainly do feel a lot better when they go to the bathroom. So, um, in conclusion, again, we've got several methods to help men go to the bathroom a little bit more easily. You know, we started with surgery and then branched into a number of different medications. We've got new and, and evolving links, we think, between things like metabolic syndrome, heart disease, your ability to have erections, uh, as well as your urinary symptoms. So, I'll take any questions. Yes, gentleman in the hat. Yeah, I, uh, I went to a doctor here in your hospital. Sure. I got the gold standard, the laser treatment. Yeah. Reduced my prostate for a while. Yeah. However, he ruined my plumbing. I uh, Ruined your plumbing. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that I'm now incontinent. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing diapers. I'm taking incontinence medicine, mm -hmm. which has given me dry mouth syndrome. And okay. Here's how I went to the dentist and he had to pull 10 teeth. Okay. I'm living in a town where the women outnumber the men five to one. So I have no <laughs> desire to chase after. Sure. Which is not my usual uh, mode of operandi. Uh huh. And uh, so that's how my funding has gotten ruined. So let me let me ask you. Why do you doctors give us incontinence medicine that that one step forward, two steps back? Sure. So in, in, I'm going to ask you a, a, a few questions before I answer your question. So, um, and I do this just because I'm a specialist in this. So. Let's back up for a second. In terms of your incontinence, and you know, if you don't want to share any of this, let us know. So do you leak when you cough, laugh, sneeze, or is it you leak more because you have an urge to go to the bathroom but don't quite make it in time? And a lot of the women know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's, it's urge incontinence. It's urge incontinence, okay. And did you have a lot of urgency prior to surgery? No. No, you did not, okay. So uh, without knowing your tests further, I'm gonna make some very general comments. So. In general, when men come to see us and they say, I can't, I'm, I'm not going to the bathroom that well. Probably when you have the type of operation that you had, and I tell my patients that laser, non-laser, at the end of the day, it probably doesn't really matter. What really matters is whether the technique was done appropriately, okay? That when you open up the prostate, and let me sort of go back a couple slides. So if you remember my pretty pictures to start, do you remember this picture here, right? So most men your age come in with a bladder and a prostate that look like this, right? And so when we do the laser procedure, the idea is to kind of make this channel appear here, okay? In general, about 60 to 70 percent of men, when you do that, urinate better. So hopefully your urinary flow has improved since the surgery. I don't know that for a fact, but hopefully it has. But the secondary changes in the bladder, remember I said urination is a two-part process, the secondary changes in the bladder usually take about 12 months to, to settle in. So for example, I tell all my patients to start, in fact, when you have this type of procedure with me, laser or otherwise, in fact, the first three or four weeks, you may be going to the bathroom even more than when you first came to see me. And you're going to ask yourself, why did I put myself through this? 
Now, that dissipates by itself in about 60 to 70 percent of men. There are, conversely, 30 to 40 percent of men where the overactive bladder, and the, most of the women in the audience will know what I'm talking about, where the overactive bladder persists. And they wind up having a picture, I think is probably similar to yours, where you say, God, I, you know, gosh, I got this urge to go to the bathroom all the time, I can't quite make it, I'm wearing pads or diapers or, or, or you know, some, something of that ilk. You know, the, if you're in that latter group of, of people, we can try things like anticholinergic medications, which it sounds like, you know, has made your mouth dry. Uh, we've got other, we have a second generation of medications that can actually quiet your bladder now without the dry mouth. If that isn't sufficient, then we often talk to patients about things like Botox, which is, you know, something, uh, for example, a lot of movie stars use for their face to take care of wrinkles. It's actually nature's most potent muscle relaxant, and so we can actually inject Botox into your bladder to calm it down. And if that still doesn't work, we've got, even got things like pacemakers for the bladder. So, you know, there's a whole world of different things out there. The real question is, which one do you need and how will it best improve your quality of life? I spoke to my pharmacist. Sure. Most, most pharmacists know more about the drugs that the doctors are prescribing than the doctors themselves. Okay. I, asked, I told my pharmacist the problems, the side effects that I was getting. Sure. Made. Yeah. And she said all the drugs for incontinence are the same. Mm, I would tell you that there's probably... You're probably taking one of a number of six or seven medications that include things like Ditropan, Detrol, Vesicare, and Enablex, Sanctura, Gelnique, some, probably one of Otovias. I've used them all. Yeah, you've used them all, right. So those groups of, of pills are all very similar. They have similar uh, potency, they have similar side effects. I tell people picking or choosing amongst them is like deciding if you like Pepsi versus Coke better. You know, pretty similar, different brands, but pretty similar. There's a new generation of medications out there called beta-3 agonists, and it's the, the example that's uh, approved here in the U.S. is called Mirbatec or Mirabegron, which also is able to relax the bladder, but does not have the side effects that you're referring to. Yes? What are the consequences of not treating this at all? Sure. Quality of life. So, but, but it's not, it's not life threatening no. So I, I tell patients, ultimately what I do, it, you know, probably what myself and Dr. Chuck I do, unlike what Dr. Herman does, what we do is ultimately quality of life. So I'll, I'll give you an example. I've got, patient, I've got some 80-year-old patients who wake up five times a night, and they tell me, you know, a lot of you are laughing, but you, you know, you've all experienced some variation of this probably. And some of those 80-year-olds are perfectly happy. They're happy as a time. They said, doctor, it's great to see you. I'll see you in a year. You know, great to see you. Glad you're doing well. I've got, conversely, some 30-year-olds who wake up twice a night and they're climbing the walls, right? They're saying, I can't live like this, you know? And all of you are probably saying, great, dude, two times a night, I probably I'll take that any day. The trigger for when to intervene, which is what you're asking, is very much dependent, I think, upon you. So if you tell me, I don't mind taking 20 minutes to go empty my bladder in the bathroom, I'll see you in a year, I'll say, that's fine, as long as you're not having recurrent bleeding, infections, kidney failure, you know, all those, you know, critical things. But in the absence of those, it's a quality of life issue. Yeah. I was just a few minutes late. Sure. Is there a surgical procedure where you can go into the urethra yeah. and, and, and just sort of spread it out a little with, with like a heat treatment or something to open the channel a little more? Yeah, so there's, there's a number of different ways to do it. There's probably about four different types of lasers internationally. There's, mo there's the homium laser, the diode laser, the thulium laser, the green light laser. There's monopolar electricity, bipolar, bipolar plasma. So there's, there's about seven different types of mo modalities you can use to open up the channel. Is anyone the most conservative in terms of uh, avoiding side effects? So I tell people the following, you know, whether you've got a big knife, a small knife, still a knife. So it's really the technique that matters. So you could have purportedly the safest laser in the world and you know, it, it glows green, it looks cool, it looks neat, it's brand new. And if you aim in the wrong spot, you're gonna hurt someone just as badly as with the older technology. It's, it's technique that matters. Pick your, 
pick your procedure according to your surgeon, not according to the technology. I probably grew back after the laser surgery. Mm -hmm. What's the uh, what's the length of time that you get out of a surgery? So, assuming the and again, I don't know your clinical details, and we can talk about this, you know, offline. Assuming the surgery is done appropriately in, in the correct type of patients, I tell my I, I tell my patients that at the 10-year mark, 80% of them are still doing fine without medications. 20% of them will need either another intervention or may need to be put back on medications, but it's pretty durable if done for the appropriately selected patients. Can't do it in everyone, but in the appropriately selected patients, it's pretty effective. You can't correct the incontinence once it's been done. You can. We, we, why don't we talk about that offline? You know, I don't want to take away from the time for the other, other lecturers, okay? All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much. We are going to stay with the same organ, but switch gears significantly. So give me one second here. Uh, so same thing, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. We'll definitely try to leave some time for uh, questions at the end. Uh, the brief amount of time that we have is obviously way too short to talk significantly in detail about uh, everything that's going on with uh, prostate cancer, but hopefully I'll be able to um, present some of the challenges that we face and some of the things that we're trying to uh, do to overcome some of the challenges that we uh, face. So. Do a quick overview of the challenges of overdiagnosis and overtreatment, which is sometimes um, uh, an interesting concept to talk about when you're speaking about cancer. And, and prostate cancer really is unique among the cancers, and, and that's both good and uh, challenging. Um, way that we can improve biopsy outcomes and also focal therapy for uh, prostate cancer. Um, something that is not ready for prime time yet, but hopefully uh, will be sometime relatively. Uh, soon, although uh, I'll present some of the challenges of that as well. So just real quick about prostate cancer. It is the most common cancer in men. Uh, in the U.S., there are about 240,000 cases that are diagnosed a year, uh, and it's the second most common cause of cancer death in men. So there are about 30,000 uh, deaths per year uh, from prostate cancer. So obviously there is a lot of controversy, and, and sometimes the um, press kind of makes it seem like, oh, prostate cancer is nothing to worry about, but it's, this is nothing to... Um, uh, sneeze at or, or bury your head in the sand about. This is, uh, this is significant. And this was higher before the uh, start of PSA testing, which I'll talk a little bit more. So ultimately, over the course of an uh, American man's life, about one in six men will be diagnosed. And the good thing about prostate cancer is that it does have excellent survival. Again, uh, this, is, this is the good news about prostate cancer. The survival is great. Oh, about 99% in five years. Uh, what are the challenges though? So overdiagnosis is the detection of prostate quote unquote cancer that will not be clinically significant. And this is part, this is kind of the biggest mental hurdle that we have to come when talking about cancers in general. And it's such a scary word, cancer, and it's got such a, a bad stigma about it that it, it's hard to um, get past that word in and of itself. Uh, but not all cancers will be clinically significant. By clinically significant, I mean, if this were not detected, would this cause you any symptoms? Would this shorten your life? Would this cause you any quality of life issues? And many prostate cancers, in fact, would not. Um, and also the overtreatment of prostate cancer, meaning that even if it's diagnosed, do we have to be very aggressive about uh, treatment of all prostate cancers? And the idea, or the answer to that is probably no. Uh, in terms of overdiagnosis, I kind of talked about this uh, already, but many men will die with their cancer, not of their cancer, meaning if, if people uh, went years and never had their PSA checked or, or never had a prostate biopsy. In many uh, senses, men would be fine even if they did in fact have uh, cancer in their prostate. Um, and these men uh, would be none the wiser and, and not uh, better, worse off for it. Um, now the question is, why is that a problem? Why is diagnosis a problem? Well, the diagnosis of prostate cancer is a problem because most treatments uh, have significant effects on the quality of life. Um, the ones that are most well known are challenges with urinary control and also challenges with sexual function. And so this is a relatively recent uh, study that was published in the New England Journal, which is kind of our preeminent journal uh, for all of uh, medicine, uh, that showed a significant drop in sexual function uh, with men uh, who were treated for, let's see which way, 
There we go. Uh, significant drop in sexual function for men who are treated with prostate cancer, uh, both for of note, both with surgery and with radiation, and also a significant loss of urinary function in men who are treated for prostate cancer. So you know, it's our treatments in many ways, not so much the survival that causes that causes an issue for many men. Uh, the answer to this is active surveillance, the idea that, well, maybe not all men need to be treated aggressively. Uh, not all cancers are the same. It's kind of beyond the scope of, of this talk to kind of go into the details, but we have kind of surrogate uh, markers of, of um, looking at the aggressiveness of prostate cancer, what's called the Gleason score, which is how the cells look under the microscope, or looking at the volume of disease, how much disease is in the prostate, is it possibly outside of the prostate. And if it looks like very early disease, meaning the kind of disease that we don't think uh, would affect the length of a man's life, kind of treat it as a chronic disease. Monitor it closely using PSA testing, rectal exam. Unfortunately, it does involve sometimes repeated biopsies. Now, if there's any signs of increased aggressiveness, we still treat at that point, meaning if it looks like it kind of could turn into the type of cancer that would affect someone's life, treat it at that point. The goal is still to cure people. Um, but not just say, okay, you have cancer, uh, see you later, let us know when, when it's spread to your bones or, or otherwise. Um, and this is in fact really becoming the encouraged treatment for men who have very early disease and the kind of disease that we don't think is going to affect their, their length of life. But not many men get this, so even if they would qualify for this type of disease, only about 18 to 15 percent of people who are eligible choose active surveillance. And I'm going to talk about um, some of the ways maybe that we have kind of to go around that. Um, and a lot of this is based on the patient. You know, patients, again, just sometimes just can't get beyond the idea of prostate cancer uh, and the idea that they have a cancer. So moving forward, how do we kind of counteract this? Well, we'd like to improve our diagnosis of prostate cancer. Uh, PSA is kind of the biggest indicator and still the major indicator for how uh, prostate cancer is, is diagnosed. Uh, but in and of itself, it's not a very good test to be honest. It stands for prostate specific antigen, but it's not cancer specific. So basically anything that's going on in the prostate can make the PSA go up. And the only way unfortunately we have to evaluate the prostate in detail is in fact with a biopsy. So we'd like to uh, have more accurate biopsies. Um, we also want to detect the clinically significant disease. We don't want to find the disease that's not going to cause someone's uh, life to be shortened in any way. We do want to find the disease that is going to be an issue for those people. And we also want to improve the overtreatment of prostate cancer. So one of the ways it's being evaluated, there's also, again, you know, this is a huge area with lots of research right now, I'm going to be focusing on a relatively small part of it, is imaging. And why is imaging important? Well, the way we do prostate biopsies right now is we kind of randomly sample the prostate. We're hoping to catch something that may or may not be in the, in the area that we're biopsying, but we're hoping that our random samples catch it if we do it uh, well enough. That being said, random uh, biopsies actually miss about 35% of cancers, meaning that if that man were subsequently biopsied, up to a third would have uh, cancer detected. Um, I'm going to be talking about focal treatment, but focal, de uh, focal treatment depends on accurate assessment of where the cancer actually is in the uh, prostate, and we need to objectively distinguish between significant and insignificant cancers, which I've kind of uh, alluded to. So right now this is emerging as the imaging modality of choice. You know, there you might hear about CAT scans and ultrasounds. Those are not really good when it comes to looking at the prostate. MRI seems to be the uh, choice. And there's a lot of different quote unquote sequences that the radiologists look at when they're looking at uh, MRIs of the prostate. So you'll hear about T2 imaging, diffusion weighted or dynamic contrast enhancement. The details again are not necessarily so important, but basically if there's an abnormality seen on each of these sequences, that really points to an area of concern and for clinically significant disease. And that's the key thing with MRIs. It's probably not gonna show you the really little ditzels of prostate cancer that we don't necessarily wanna find, but it seems to show the possibly more aggressive uh, tumors there. So, and the recent studies show that 70 to 90% of these clinically significant um, prostate cancers are seen on, on MRI. Again, this is relatively new, this has to be validated, but it's emerging. Now the MRI is great in and of itself, but we need to translate it to clinical practice, and this is where something called fusion biopsies are coming in, where we bring in the MRI, merge it or fuse it with the ultrasound that we have in the office, and then use that fusion of the MRI with the ultrasound to really make sure that our needles are going into the right place uh, of the prostate. And this hopefully allows us to really accurately perform our prostate biopsies, really find where the disease might be in the uh, prostates. 
So this is, there's about three or four commercially available devices. This, is, this happens to be the device that we're exploring um, here at, at Cornell, which is the uh, Artemis device made by a manufacturer called Eigen. And here's kind of the idea, is that this is what the prostate looks like on the MRI. This is a pretty clear-cut case of uh, an area of the um, prostate that may be affected by a tumor. You see how it's kind of darker there. And the idea is using this device, you can really accurately target your biopsies into these areas. And just to show you a couple of examples of, of patients that we've done, for example, a 75-year-old male with a rising PSA, it's kind of hard to see here, uh, but basically this is the ultrasound image uh, of the prostate that has kind of been outlined in green here. And this is, once we have merged it with the uh, MRI, we end up with a map of the prostate, and on the MRI lesion, here's where, or he, on the MRI, this is where the lesion was, and this way we know for sure that this is really where I want to get my needles when I, when I biopsy the prostate. And in fact, the examples that I'm using are people who have had prior biopsies, and these fusion biopsies are the ones who, that ended up finding the cancer. Uh, another man, a 56-year-old gentleman, uh, two prior biopsies. Again, hard to see, but here's his prostate outlined on the uh, fusion. And he had a possible lesion on the MRI that was at the very front of the prostate. This is the hardest area for us to biopsy when we're doing random sampling of the uh, prostate because you really have to kind of push into the prostate with your needle. You really have to focus on doing it. This is an area that's particularly uh, missed. And indeed, the, that gentleman had cancer as well when we did the fusion biopsy. In terms of studies, there's more and more data to suggest that these are, in fact, more accurate. So this is a relatively recently uh, published what's called a prospective study, which is, means that it's not just looking at old data, it's looking at new data, which is important. And it basically showed that as the MRI uh, showed more significant lesions, the chance of finding significant lesions on the biopsy increased as well. And this is uh, another very important study that uh, shows um, both clinically insignificant and also clinically significant disease. And the idea being, here's the Gleason score that I alluded to before, the lower uh, the score, the less aggressive the cancer, the higher, the more aggressive. So the lower the score, kind of we don't necessarily want to find some of these cancers. That's obviously a little bit of an overstatement, but we don't necessarily want to find all of these. And it turns out, in fact, that with a targeted biopsy, since the MRI doesn't really show those little ditzels, um, you're, you don't see them, you don't target them, as opposed to the aggressive ones, which are rarely missed with the targeted biopsies and are more likely to be missed with the random biopsies in the prostate. So just in summary, MRI is gaining some acceptance in finding clinically significant disease, and fusion, fusion biopsies are showing promise in increasing the accuracy of uh, prostate biopsy, and importantly may reduce the finding of this insignificant cancer that we don't necessarily want to find. Very briefly about focal therapy, um, the rationale for focal therapy is that most men are diagnosed with uh, localized, meaning only confined to the prostate, low or moderate risk disease. Uh, and full gland therapy, meaning this surgery for prostatectomy or radiation for uh, prostate cancer, uh, although often curative carries significant uh, costs, as we talked about at the, at the beginning. So the idea, again, is that active surveillance, although it's great for some people, still carries significant downside. Uh, you're not really able to predict at this point who will progress. There's a delay in intervention, so while people are kind of waiting, there's obviously the idea of being diagnosed with cancer and not doing anything. There is the need for repeat biopsies. Um, it's unclear how men do once they actually go through surgery or radiation, if they've been on active surveillance for a while, and we just don't have as long a follow-up for active surveillance. Also, focal therapy may fill a gap for people who don't quite qualify for this very stringent um, group that we would like to put on active surveillance, but still don't have particularly aggressive prostate cancer. And the hope would be that we would avoid urinary, sexual, and bowel side effects uh, that we see with some of the other treatments. And if you think about many of the other organ systems, for the most part, we do do focal therapy for cancer. So, you know, colon cancer, it's not like the whole colon is removed, or breast cancer. Uh, you know, mastectomies used to be done for all women, and it turned out to be a very, very morbid disease, and a uh, very, very, very morbid surgery, rather. And that most women didn't need a full mastectomy, that lumpectomies would be fine for many uh, of the cancers. So the idea is the same, and trying to translate to that to the prostate. Unfortunately, surgically speaking, other than just not, it's not the same surgery as uh, Dr. Lee was mentioning because you can't kind of scrape the cancer out from the inside. So you can't remove part of the prostate gland from the outside. So you can't really do it surgically the way you can with some of these other uh, treatments. 
Um, but we have the challenge that we still can't accurately diagnose it. So like I mentioned, we need to know where prostate cancer is in the prostate for us to accurately uh, focally treat it. And this is probably the major obstacle is that we are still having a hard time finding where exactly the cancer is in the prostate. And that for many men, prostate cancer is a uh, quote unquote multifocal disease that it is in fact in multiple areas of the prostate. Now that's not to say that we have to treat all those in multiple areas. Maybe some of those areas could be watched and some of those areas need to be treated. So it's really a matter of treating an individual's disease as opposed to uh, imposing relatively blunt uh, treatments on some of these uh, people. So in terms of future directions, we need to increase our diagnostic accuracy. I haven't talked at all about biomarkers. Obviously this is a huge area of research. Like I said, PSA uh, is not a great test. There are other things like prostate health index that are emerging. There's some urinary tests that are out there like PCA3 or a newer one using uh, what are called gene fusions to hopefully be more specific for prostate cancer rather than PSA, which is not specific for prostate cancer. We're looking at newer imaging modalities. So MRI is still a relatively blunt test. We'd like to really focus on some uh, molecular imaging. So looking at a molecular level, where are the cells actually abnormal in the prostate? Um, we're trying to define uh, which uh, treatments work best, which treatments uh, lead to the best side effects or lowest side effects for people. Uh, so what are we doing here? I kind of already mentioned uh, fusion biopsies. We're already uh, performing fusion biopsies for men. Uh, cryotherapy is a form of uh, what's called a blade of therapy using hot or cold to treat uh, cancer cells. And we're both doing it for whole gland as well as for focal therapy for some uh, eligible people. And we're looking at investigational uh, modalities like irreversible electroporation and, and MRI guided focused ultrasound. Uh, basically different ways to try to kill uh, prostate cancer cells without uh, some of the side effects of some of the other treatments. Uh, this is some molecular imaging that we're looking at, trying to really look at a cellular level, uh, what's going on inside the prostate, and we also have what's called the Precision Medicine Institute, where we're uh, using a lot of genetic information and really trying to individualize uh, people's treatment based on the genetics of their disease. So again, that's a really <laughs> brief summary of a huge, huge topic that has lots of complexity. We're just, to be honest, in the beginning stages of really trying to focus in on this stuff. Uh, so I'm happy to accept any questions. Thank you so much. Yeah. I understand there's a, with the biopsies, a number of cases end up in infections. It's a great point. So obviously, um, one of the things that medicine in general is becoming more cognizant of is that as we've used so many antibiotics, we've not just treated infection, but we've generated resistant organisms. So that's one of the issues, is that we've generated bugs that are resistant to the antibiotics that we have. Also, currently, the way we do most biopsies is uh, transrectally through the rectum. That obviously has some uh, bacteria in it, and so it does lead to some significant infections. We are trying to reduce the uh, complication rate of infections. The infection rate uh, goes anywhere between 2 to 4%. In the literature, I think in actual practice, uh, the way we're using antibiotics these days, it's less than that. I think it's significantly less than that in our practice. But you're right. Some people get very, very sick from the biopsy in and of itself. That's the infection. There's also a small chance for bleeding uh, as well. What if you remove the prostate completely? That's where you get the morbidity. Um, removing the prostate uh, completely is uh, called a prostatectomy as opposed to the quote-unquote rotor-rooter solution. Um, that is a morbid surgery. A, it's a major surgery with a, its own risk of uh, bleeding infection, damage to uh, structures like the intestines. But there's also a, a significant risk of urinary incontinence afterwards and a significant uh, decrease in sexual function in many men after a prostatectomy, just based on the anatomy. Again, the challenge with prostate cancer is not really the disease itself. The disease itself is actually in, uh, incredibly treatable. The, the challenge really is where the prostate is located uh, based on the surrounding structures and all the, all the um, uh, high value territory nearby, meaning the continence mechanisms and the sexual function mechanisms. Yeah. Uh, are the new uh, diagnostic and treatment uh, methods that you talked about, are they widespread or are they only, uh, I mean, available to patients throughout the country, for example, or are they only focused at large medical centers like Rock? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. The fusion biopsies um, right now are, are relatively focused at, at small centers, and that's because the equipment that's used to do the actual fusion is just incredibly expensive, and most places just are not able to afford it. It's also still, to be frank, you know, being evaluated. It has not a, a achieved mainstream acceptance yet, so I would not call the standard of care. I think it's something that many of us are interested in and have seen some clinical benefit in individual patients. Is this the kind of thing that's going to spread to a big population level? We don't know that uh, answer yet, and so that's the other reason is probably localized to some centers. Um, in terms of imaging, 
MRI is what I've talked about mostly, um, and it turns out that MRI is really dependent on who's reading the MRI, mm -hmm. and that some people uh, who have a lot of experience with MRI, you know, we work very closely with our radiologists, so we give them feedback. Uh, you know, if, if they think that something might be concerning on the MRI and we do a biopsy there and it turns out not to be or it turns out that the lesion was actually somewhere else, we work very closely with them so that we have, we learn together. Uh, you know, if people are doing an MRI every once in a while, it, it may not be the same. Plus, the actual technique uh, in terms of those kind of different quote-unquote sequences is, is different and, and uh, may not be um, uh, optimized at certain locations. So, there is still a lot to be evaluated and a lot to be standardized uh, across prostate cancer. So, it, it's a very good question. But you don't do fusion here at this time. No, we do. We do. Um, Dr. Herman? Yeah. Are you uh, running an active surveillance pilot or research project now? I think most urologists at this point have active surveillance uh, patients in their, in their practice. I think it's definitely one of the areas that I'm most interested in. I definitely um, am a big believer in active surveillance in order to reduce the uh, morbidity. So I think most urologists do, and it is a big interest here. Uh, one of our major applications that we put through for the NIH or the National Institutes of Health is to evaluate our, our active surveillance group and try to look at the genetic markers for who's going to progress. Whose prostate cancer, even if it's not aggressive right now, whose cancer is going to get aggressive in five years. And if we could figure that out and treat them earlier, then we might spare some of the side effects of treatment. And then whose isn't going to get more aggressive? Whose is going to be the kind of thing that he's going to live to 90, 95, uh, and this is never going to progress at all, and this just happened to be picked up on biopsy? Is there a strong correlation between uh, calcium intake and the frequency of prostate cancer? And are there any other dietary uh, correlations with prostate cancer? The dietary issues is an interesting issue. There definitely seems to be something about the Western diet that increases the risk of uh, prostate cancer. So for example, we've looked at uh, Asian men, and Asian men in general uh, have a lower risk of, of prostate cancer. But when they move to the U.S. and adopt a Western diet within a generation, uh, the rate of prostate cancer increases significantly. Uh, it's unclear exactly what about the diet is uh, cancer causing. Um, so we don't have specific recommendations. I think in general we say that do what you should be doing anyway, which is eating lots of fruits and vegetables. You know, over five servings of fruits and vegetables uh, a day uh, seems to significantly reduce the risk of cancer. Probably less red meat consumption is important and also less grilled stuff. So all that uh, nice grilled char stuff is... So calcium is just not as clear. I'm, I don't believe that's that what there's, heard, what's that? I, that's what I heard about. The data is very mixed. Correlation. Yeah, the data is very mixed. So not, it, it's not one way or the other at this point. So at this point, we don't say avoid a high calcium diet or, or uh, do a high calcium diet. We don't think that there's strong data that can make us say one way or the other. Now the cardiac side is also being evaluated because a lot of the things that uh, are thought to be going on with heart disease is related. Who knows if it's common inflammatory pathways or whatever the case may be, but the cardiac side of things is, is different. What's different? We, you don't, good for the other? No, probably what's good for one is good for the other. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> Are there any uh, adverse effects to having a biopsy? The major risk of infection is a big one. Uh, there's been, it's been looked at whether or not repeated biopsies reduce uh, sexual function. Uh, in general, it does not seem to be the case, but you do have individual patients who feel like after a biopsy, their sexual function may have decreased, and that's because of the nerves for sexual function run so close to the prostate that it's possible that just for that individual person that might have uh, led to some challenges. But in general, it's not thought in and of itself, unless there's a complication, uh, to be a long-term issue. Yeah? After being diagnosed with prostate cancer, there's so many yeah. I think that's one of the hardest things about prostate cancer is again, and that's not because the cancer itself is bad. The cancer itself is not bad. Uh, it's that uh, there's so many options. Um, I think you have to really go to someone who's going to give you the pros and cons of each of those. And I think there are pros and cons to each therapy. And I think what's right for one person is not what's right for the other. And so if someone's going to try to give a blanket approach to, okay, you have prostate cancer, this is what, is what we're going to do, I don't think that's the right thing. I think you have to evaluate the individual's cancer, the individual's risk of progression or this cancer causing an issue. You have to talk to them about their current uh, sexual function and urinary function. And you have to talk to them about what their goals are. Some people, their sexual function is not a major issue for them. 
uh, depending on their stage of life. And so that, that removes that concern from the um, discussion. You also have to look at their uh, other medical conditions. So it really is a very individualized thing, and people should get second opinions. I mean, I, I don't think it's the kind of thing where you just go to one person and do whatever that person says. I think it's worth going to a surgeon. They're going to be inclined to some of the urologic options, going to a radiation oncologist, hearing the different perspective. I think it's very important. Um, and then also talking to the people that, that you trust and, and know, and they know you. And I think for the most part, people end up settling on the uh, decision that's right for them. Uh, I think there's very few people who uh, ultimately end up with the wrong decision. Again, there's always pros and cons for each of them, but ultimately most people find the right treatment for them. Thank you, Dr. Herman. All right, thank you so much. All right. Good evening. Um, I guess we have <clears throat> 11 minutes to get through this presentation. <laughs> you can take your time. Okay. We don't mind extending the time to cover the material. Sounds great. All right. Well, my name is Bilal Chungtai. I'm one of the uh, one of the urologists here. Talk up so we can all get to uh, my name is Bilal Chugtai. I'm one of the urologists who focus on voiding dysfunction like Dr. Lay. And so today we're going to discuss uh, updates in women's health, uh, some novel therapies and some new therapies to keep you dry. Um, so the beginning portion of this lecture probably applies both to men and women. Okay? So bladder control, so a couple of facts that we're going to go over. So bladder control problems affect about 33 million Americans. 85% of which are, which are women. Now, if you compare that to other very common disease states of the elderly, Alzheimer's affects about 5.4 million people, diabetes 25.8 million, and the point is that it's not necessarily only el older people, it can also be younger people as well. What is incontinence or what is a bladder control problem? It's anything that causes a loss of voluntary control over urinary function, and it can consist from either a loss of a few drops of urine all the way to um, emptying the bladder completely. So what are some of the common misconceptions? They include, it's part of normal aging, or it's part of everyday life. Some people just accept it, wear pads. It's not severe enough or frequent enough to treat. It's too embarrassing, they don't bring it up to their doctors. Because how, how is a doctor supposed to help you without knowing about it? Um, and also some people argue, treatment won't help. But you can't know unless you ask. It also tends to be a very hidden condition. Many patients self-manage. They avoid frequently, they reduce fluid intake, they wear pads. Nearly two-thirds of patients are um, symptomatic for a long time, almost two years, before they seek any treatment. And 30% of the people who even seek treatment, a lot of them are just blown off, told, it's okay, it's, it says you get older, this is what happens. And also 80% of people are near, aren't even examined. So it's important to bring this up to your doctors, and if it's a problem for you, and discuss it with them, so that treatments can be sought. These are some of the things that you know, can help you decide. I mean, can help you determine if this is a problem for you. Is that is bladder control always on your mind? Do you do you find yourself staying near bathrooms? Do you know every single bathroom in New York City? Um, have you stopped doing things that you like because you're worried that you have to go to the bathroom? Do you turn down invitations from friends or family and stay home alone because you're you're worried about incontinence or leakage episodes? Do you also get up several times at night? Okay. So now we're going to talk about some of the different types of incontinence. There's two main types. There's stress incontinence, which means that there's loss of urine when there's physical stress. So in other words, coughing, laughing, sneezing. Sort of like the question that Dr. Lee was asking you in regards to the type of incontinence. Or urge incontinence, where you have this sudden strong urge to go and there could be leakage. So the thing to keep in mind is that, <clears throat> that when it comes to incontinence, that there's something called, you know, there's pure stress, there's pure urge incontinence, and then there's a lot of stuff that sort of can get mixed. So some people can have symptoms of both types of incontinence. So we're going to talk about exactly how to tell the difference between the two. So stress incontinence mainly occurs when the pelvic muscles aren't strong. And so the bladder neck can open up and you can, there can be leakage. Here we can see examples of pretty young people who, given enough physical um, exertion, um, leaked. And again, the signs of it are with laughing, coughing, lifting, exercising, or anything that increases abdominal pressure in any way. So what are some of the causes? Um, obviously this doesn't apply to men, but childbirth. Um, there's also um, aging, can sometimes lead to weak pelvic floor, as well as uh, previous pelvic surgery. 
Now, there is some thought that by decreasing modifiable factors like excessive weight gain or excessive abdominal weight can help decrease incontinence as well as decreasing smoking as well as controlling diabetes. So now we're going to discuss some of the things that make up urge incontinence, the other type of main incontinence, which basically the definition is seven or more visits to the bathroom per 24 hours or in one day, also urinating at night and also urinating two, more, uh, two or more times at night. So urgency and also it is composed of a component of urgency, which basically means that there's a sudden strong desire to urinate and also can include urge incontinence, which can include emptying of the bladder. So it can be very large amounts of urine. Typically, stress incontinence tends to be smaller amounts of leakage. So again, just to help differentiate the two in a, in a chart form, so urge incontinence has that sense of urgency, so that rush to the bathroom. Frequency um, goes with the urge incontinence as well, going very often. Leaking during physical activity is usually more with stress incontinence, the amount of leakage tends to be small with stress incontinence. And the ability to reach the toilet in time with urge incontinence tends to be rare. Um, and also waking up uh, at night to urinate usually goes with the complex of overactive bladder or urge incontinence. Right. Any questions so far? Okay. All right, so just to go over some basic anatomy. So basically your, 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 the urinary system is composed of two kidneys, the tubes that connect the kidney to the bladder, um, which carry urine, the bladder itself, which is a muscular organ, then from there it's the, the sphincter, which helps, close, which helps keep the bladder closed, and then the, um, the urethra itself, which allows you to urinate. Now, the thing to keep in mind, the bladder has two important functions. One is storage, and the other one is emptying. So the goal is when any of these go wrong, that's when you can end up with things like stress or urge incontinence. So there's things that you can do. Like for example, if you're having some leakage, you can avoid things that are no, like no common bladder irritants. Common ones are things like coffee, tea, soda. These things are known to cause the bladder to be irritated. Also red wine's another one. Um, avoid constipation, because the nerves that go to the bladder and the nerves that go to the rectum are, are, very, are actually very close proximity. So as a result, when one goes, um, when you have constipation, the bladder has trouble too. The other thing is I'm sure um, everyone in this room has heard of Kegel exercises or pelvic floor exercises. That helps with both types of incontinence. But the thing to keep in mind with, with uh, any type of muscle training, it takes weeks. It's not something that happens overnight. It takes weeks to get better. But if you're patient and you, and you work at it, you can see a lot of improvements. Um, so again, so there's behavioral modifiable techniques, which is uh, the Kegel exercises. Basically involves contracting the pelvic floor muscles. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that you may not see improvement for a while. Now, <clears throat> these are some of the treatments that we have to offer for um, stress incontinence. These include behavioral therapy, drug therapy, there's catheters or absorbent pads that can be offered, injectable agents um, that, could be, that, could, that can be used to help bulk the urethra. Also, different types of surgeries can be offered. So one of the type of treatments that we offer is something called biofeedback. So biofeedback basically uh, allows for the greater awareness of the pelvic floor, allows you to identify the muscles. Because explaining a Kegel exercise is very difficult. It's hard to explain it, you can't really see the muscles, and so some people aren't able to really identify it. So biofeedback is something that we do in the office that can help teach and, or help, help people learn how to do the exercises properly to get the most effectiveness out of it. Uh, another thing for stress incontinence is using something called a bulking agent. So it's injected literally right around the urethra to help close up the space. When it closes up the space, there's less leakage. Okay. Another option is um, a sling, which we see here. Let's see if it works. Uh, well, there was a video here. Um, and the way, and basically what it demonstrates is that a sling basically supports the bladder neck, which we can see right here. And what that does is it, when a person coughs, laughs, or sneezes, or has increased abdominal pressure, it helps uh, compress the urethra, so it prevents leakage altogether. Now, um, urge incontinence. Um, do we have time to yeah, keep going? Yeah. Are you guys uh -huh. okay with uh, listening to a couple more slides? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then there's urgent incontinence, which is rushing to the bathroom, and I'll see if this slide worked. Okay. Well, what this slide was going to demonstrate was uh, basically 
<clears throat> there's different types of nerves that go to the bladder. There's nerves that help control emptying, there's ones that control storage, there's ones that control pain. Mm -hmm. And the point is sometimes these nerves sometimes will get overactive, underactive, and this can lead to some degrees of what we call urge incontinence. Now, as Dr. Lee had mentioned, there's a slew of medications out there designed for <coughs> urge incontinence. And almost all of them have very, very, very similar symptoms, which is dry mouth constipation. And they have varying degrees of dry mouth and constipation. But these are, these are sometimes first-line agents that are used, but depending on the dosing, depending on the regimens, there are ways to sort of get around um, the dry mouth and constipation. Common tricks that people will tell you, uh, uh, like a sugar-free sucking candy. Like trying the candy, a lot of times can take care of the dry mouth. Also, don't, use, don't drink more water to compensate for the dry mouth. Because by drinking more water, what do you think that makes you do? Go to the bathroom more often. This is a new agent that's come out. Now, this medication is very different. It's, it's been out in the market probably for a year or two. And what it does is that it, um, its side effects are mainly raising the blood pressure, but by a very small amount, and sometimes uh, causing some uh, urine tract infections, which are pretty rare. We haven't really seen it much in practice. But these are sort of like the slew of medications that are out there. Now, if these medications don't work, or if these medications aren't tolerated, there's other things that can be done. One is something called Botox, which, is, um, which can be injected into the bladder. And what this does is it literally paralyzes the bladder or slows down the bladder. Depending on the amount that's used, it can go anywhere from just slowing it down to completely paralyzing it. So that's one option. And the other option is something called a, it's, a, it's, a, it's called a Interstim, which is a bladder pacemaker. So it's literally a pacemaker that's installed around, near the, it's actually installed in the back, and the fibers of it go to the nerves that go to the bladder. It helps the bladder sort of get regulated and sort of prevent these episodes of urgency, frequency, and incontinence. And for the right patient, it works really well. Any questions? I think recently, I mean, I can be out during the day, everything's fine, and every, every other body function, and as soon as I put my key in the door, walk out. And, and I wonder if it's psychological. Why is it when I'm outside? What you're describing is actually very common. There's different names for it. Doorknob incontinence, keyhole incontinence. And basically, <laughs> the reason why these names have come about is that there's something about the firing of like the fact that you know that you're near Near and, the house. and of course, the bathroom, right? You know, like yeah, and you're and you're rushing to there, and sometimes you almost don't make it. It's it's very common that we we sort of see that. One thing you can do is that when you know you're approaching the house, sometimes doing something as simple as a few Kegel exercises can help sort of break that cycle, break that thing from happening, so you don't have that problem. It's amazing, amazing. Yes. Aren't we supposed to drink eight cups of, of water each day? Do you know where that comes from? No. That comes from Weight Watchers. Oh, so Weight Watchers designed that in the 70s. And the reason why they did that is because the logic is that if you're drinking more water, you're not eating. So you're losing weight. Yeah. So that's where that came from. Eight glasses of water, it, I'm not, it, really you should drink to thirst. Now it depends. If there's other conditions, that if your doctor recommends you have more water, then you should have more water. But for the most part, if you're thirsty, you drink. If you're not thirsty, you don't drink. Most of the food that we have has a lot of water in there, so you don't need to add an additional eight glasses of water. And lots well, of fruits and vegetables. Don't the kidneys need to, a lot of water? Well, you have a thirst mechanism. So if you get thirsty, you'll drink. I'm not saying don't drink water. What I'm saying is you drink to thirst. Don't, don't add on excess water. Well, most of us are walking around dehydrated. Yeah, <laughs> especially in the summer. And, if and, you're, and absolutely, if you're dehydrated, you need to drink water. <laughs> We're 70% water, just mm -hmm. like the Earth, uh, yeah. planet is. And, we, and most people don't get the eight glasses of water a day. But the, the point and is that... all our organs depend upon it. Absolutely, and your kidneys are actually very good at regulating how much water is in your body. That's a very tightly controlled mechanism. What I'm saying is not, not to not drink water. What I'm saying is you don't need to add on excess water. If you're thirsty, you absolutely should drink. If you're out on a hot day, you should absolutely drink water. If you go the route of the injectable agent, for how long do you have success? And do you have to do that very often? So with the injectable agent, um, a lot of times it works fairly well with just one treatment. Success rates are probably around like 80% or so. But some people require a touch-up within six to 12 months. And then, from there, there's a pretty durable response around like maybe 70 or 80%. And that would reduce uh, the frequency 
No, it reduces the leakage that can occur leakage. with cough, okay. laugh, sneeze. Okay. Just for that alone. Mm -hmm. How long does that last? Um, for some, it depends. Um, for some people, it lasts a fair amount of time. Some people, it's a little bit shorter. It's not the best repair out there, but it's also fairly um, benign in the sense that worst comes to worst, you have a failure. Mm -hmm. Could you explain what overactive water means in terms of if you're not drinking a lot of liquids and you don't have all that water in your system, how does it manufacture more, more water than you ever took in? Well, what you're asking is a great question. And what that is is that, um, so you have to remember, when you go to the bathroom, you don't know exactly how much is coming out. Sometimes when it comes out, it's a few drops. Sometimes when it comes out, it's a full bladder. Obviously, the more you drink, the more you're going to have these full bladder episodes. When you drink less, sometimes the nerves of the bladder are just overactive. And as a result, even when there's a tiny little bit in there, you feel the urge to go. And that's sort of how overactive bladder, and we don't have an exact mechanism sketched out. We don't understand overactive bladder completely. But that's sort of our rudimentary understanding of it. Are there incontinence drugs that don't uh, cause, um, don't cause dry mouth and yes. low libido? Uh, yes, okay, so with the um, incontinence medications, the ones that call, are for urgency frequency, they typically cause dry mouth, constipation, dry eyes. That's usually what you see. Now, there is a new agent called Mirabegron, which doesn't cause that. But it's a relatively new agent. And if you have high blood pressure, it's not a good one to use. Well, the, the truth is that when, whenever we start the medication, what I usually do is check the, check the blood pressure within a week. So I make sure the blood pressure isn't trending upward. And for the most part, we've seen it's, it's relatively safe. But if there's any question, of course, we're not going to keep someone on an agent that affects their blood pressure. Thank you, guys. Thank you for allowing me to present. Thank you very much.